I'd like to begin by conducting a short survey for which I'll need all of your participation. Raise your hand if you've ever been asked the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? OK, everybody, basically. Wonderful. Lower your hands. Raise your hand if you remember being asked that question for the first time around the age of one years old. Okay, we have some excellent memories in the crowd. Keep your hands up, add your hands in if it was maybe around the age of two. How about three? Four years old? Five years old? Excellent. By the age of five, the majority of us in this theater had already been asked this classic, pestering, totally uncreative question that adults constantly throw at children, usually following the question, what's your name and how old are you, followed by a couple of cheek pinches if you're lucky. From the moment we're young, we're asked to step into a box of sorts and to identify ourselves with what we want our futures to look like. Subconsciously, we begin to define our sense of self with a job or a career. We determine where we're going to go before reflecting on where we've come from. I remember waffling between a number of ideas as I was growing up, from marine research scientists during my orca whale and dolphin obsession phase, to search and rescue helicopter pilot, to biomedical engineer. I'm still not sure what they do, but I did want to be one. To the Prime Minister of Canada, to gynecologist, as I walked through life, I had the privilege of dreaming up endless possibilities for what I could become. But lingering in the back was this nagging pressure to choose one box and to dedicate all of my plans and activities to that one thing. Fluffy ideas and imagined jobs became insufficient. Dreams became insufficient. I needed to pick a path a known path that others deemed realistic for me. In the absence of knowing what other options were out there, I began answering the question of what I wanted to become with doctor, a profession that had constantly been sold to me as a prestigious one, and one that had a rather clearly defined path to attain. This aspiration, if you will, permeated my decisions through my teenage years all the way to university. I entered Wellesley College with the intention of majoring in biochemistry as a pre-medicine student. For the first two and a half years of my undergraduate career, I immersed myself in organic chemistry and biology and physics and mathematics. Even my non-science classes were about science and medicine, medicine and literature, reproductive health rights and politics. But it was my very first anthropology class that would swerve me off the path. In my first year, I took a class called The Vulnerable Body. In this class, we explored how social categories inscribed themselves onto the human body, how categories like gender, nationality, religion, and even beauty informed and influenced embodied practices. I remember reading texts that showed me how throughout history, Certain communities' bodies were weaponized as units to be controlled and made docile, and how medical practices were often at the center of these processes. All of a sudden, I began to question the entire field of medicine, systems on which it had been constructed, the field that I was planning on entering, and that up until this point, I had basically built my identity on. A critical seed had been planted in my mind, but I wouldn't know the depth and power of roots until some time later. In the fall of my second year, race politics would emerge to the forefront of public discourse in the United States as the Black Lives Matter movement ignited. Together with my people, I would participate in solidarity with the protests that were gripping the nation. He blocked entire highways to call attention to the severity of systemic racism within the country. Now, admittedly, at this point, I didn't quite know what I was a part of or the intricacies of Western race politics, 
nor did I fully understand the role that brown communities like mine continue to play in the perpetuation of anti-black racism. But what I did know, on a basic level, was that this was an opportunity to amplify voices that were speaking truth to power, that were making their stories known. I also began to realize how very little I knew about the people and places that surrounded me, the histories, the stories, the communities, everything that was converging in that present moment. So I decided that this next semester, I would make a change. I decided that instead of selecting courses based on distribution requirements and degree requirements, I would choose the classes that I wanted, that I was interested in that filled the gaps in knowledge that I had identified for myself. I took classes that taught me about how practices of colonial medicine attempted to discipline South and Central Asian bodies. I took classes in which I learned about how notions of Western environmentalism were actually destroying livelihoods, and ironically, the environment, and how racialized communities often bore the brunt of these consequences. I argued with my professors, who engaged in tone-deaf analyses that erased the inequities that were surrounding us, and who curated reading lists for our classes that only showcased Western white authors. I was questioning the world around me in ways that I had never done before, peeling back the messages I had received throughout my education, wondering and analyzing what I had been told, and more importantly, what I hadn't been told. And through all this, I realized that the stories and narratives to which I had been exposed throughout my education excluded the experiences of people who looked and thought and spoke like me. And when we were included, it was often an inaccurate depiction riddled with assumptions and stereotypes, usually written by some white guy. In my third year of university, I listened to a talk by a, an English professor at my school. His name was Professor Larry Rosenwald. In his talk, he made a case for the critical role imagination plays in the realm of development. In essence, he claims that if we want to build structures and systems that we've never seen before, then we must be willing to act in ways that we've never done. Now, I really, really, really wanted to be inspired by this rather simple but powerful idea. But for some reason, there was something about it that just didn't sit well with me. In fact, at this point, there were a lot of things that were unsettling me. The decisions that I had been sure of were unraveling. The clear path to becoming a doctor was becoming less and less appealing. I wasn't sure of much in these moments. I wasn't sure where I was going. But I knew that I needed to make a decision, which was this. I wasn't going to continue to major in biochemistry. I wasn't going to continue to fulfill pre-medicine requirements. And at this point, I had only three semesters left to fulfill another entire set of degree requirements so that I could walk away with a shiny piece of paper that told the world that I knew some things. What I started to appreciate throughout all this was that it wasn't about graduating with a fancy degree. It was about the questions I answered and the answers I questioned. It was about the decisions I made and also unmade along the way. It was about having the courage to jump into my unknown. The deeper I dove, the more surface I broke. And amidst all of this, my thirst for the truth continued to grow. In the next two years after graduating successfully with a degree in anthropology, I would return to the country I grew up in, Canada, in a totally new way. Armed with a sharper set of analytical tools, I began digging through the landscape of Canadian society to unearth the stories and experiences that would enable me to understand who I was and where I belonged in all of this. The jobs I had were positions with organizations that enabled me to explore these ideas and to support others in doing the same. I served as a policy consultant. 
I went into curriculum consulting. I even dabbled in youth program development. Now, from the outside, it might seem like I was jumping from one place to another to another with no set direction, and in many ways, I was because I was trying to figure out who I was and where I could make an impact. The common denominator through all of these experiences was a commitment to telling stories in search of equity and justice. Now, remember Professor Larry Rosenwald, the professor I had mentioned a little bit earlier? He, he was the one who posited that imagination played a critical role in development, that we needed to imagine new things in order to create change. Well, the patience that I had granted myself over the two years after graduating enabled me to understand why his idea had felt so uneasy for me. You see, what I had begun to realize in my experiences was that the systems we were seeking to change, the structures we wanted to influence, were built without the stories and experiences of communities like mine at their center. So for me, Bringing about change isn't about imagining something I've never known before. It's about bringing the stories of my community from the peripheries, from the margins, to the center. It's about reclaiming our narratives. It's about making our stories known. Today, I work in communication. My job is to tell stories in the best way that I can. My job is to build relationships within my own community so that we can understand how to tell our stories to the world in ways that are dignified and true, so that we can not only get the things we want and need, but the things that we truly deserve. It has taken me a whole host of experiences and actions and reflections to realize that my tools are not going to be scalpels and needles, but words and stories and images. If you ask me where I'll end up in the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, or what I'm going to be when I grow up, I still can't answer that question for you in a definite way. Some days I feel like I want to be a journalist. Other days I dream of going into documentary production, but what I can guarantee is no matter what corner of the world I'm in, no matter what mountain range I find myself among, I will have found a way to tell my story, to tell our stories to the world. Now, when people ask me about what I do or what my next move is going to be, I'm less fixated on appealing to their ideas of what a career should look like. My experiences have led me to value and prioritize processes and stories over end goals and targets. This isn't to say that I don't have goals and dreams and visions of who I want to be, what I want to do, and what I want the world around me to look like, but I have come to seek those ideas, not by setting a target on them, but by identifying the transformational processes that I might need to experience in order to prepare myself for those goals and opportunities. And oftentimes, I found that those lessons and processes lie off the edge of my comfort zone. The decisions that I continue to make today aren't obsessed with building a career from a set of known paths, of ticking off boxes someone else built. My decisions are about finding ways in which I can rewrite wrongs and write new truths because it isn't about where I go, but about how I get there.